This room, uh, built by Croxton and Whittington, when it was completed, was the second largest secular space in England. Only Westminster Hall was larger. It's nearly 50 meters long and 17 and a half meters wide. And it was an engineering feat to cover it. As far as we know, uh, unlike Westminster Hall, it was covered with great, uh, a great stone vaulted roof with great stone um, arches. Inside, uh, there were daises at each end, here and here, where the courts could be held. On the north side was the entrance to the most important court, which, of course, was the Lord Mayor's Court here in a separate building. And off to the side, in a little uh, court here, was the Alderman's uh, Court. And I think it's interesting that uh, the most, uh, most of the really important rooms were rebuilt um, smaller uh, and warmer and more comfortable, while the Great Hall was built bigger uh, and grander without any form of heating. Why didn't Croxton simply build uh, courtrooms for these courts as well instead of, the, instead of leaving them in this huge um, unheated hall? The answer to this is the clue to understanding this building. The importance of what was being uh, built here is because uh, Croxton's Guildhall was no ordinary building. It was a deeply traditional structure steeped in rich symbolism. You see, great halls are the fundamental building unit of English architecture from the Saxons until after the Civil War. Long before the Normans conquered England, the Great Hall was the centre of gravity of life for the rich, their families, and their retinues. But what the Normans were to do was to build one hall that was to change all the rules. And this, of course, was the hall that I've already mentioned, built at Westminster Palace by William the Conqueror's son, William Rufus. Rufus's hall stood as the great royal throne room until in 1393, Richard II, who you see here sitting on his throne, decided to modernise it, a project that he completed in 1401. He retained the massive uh, Norman walls here and here, um, but he inserted big new Gothic uh, windows um, into them, and the Norman roof was place, replaced by the largest and most important piece of carpentry in Western Europe, this spectacular hammer beam roof, which you see here in this drawing. And on each of these hammer beams, these are the pieces that stick out here, you can see there was a massive angel holding the arms of England. This roof was thus a representation of the heavens spread out over the earthly court of Richard II. And this was not the only religious connotation in the hall, because on the south wall, behind the dais here, there were six niches. One, two, three, four, five, six. They're still there. Um, and these contained figures of kings, rather like a cathedral pulpitum. So here's York's, York Minster. Niches containing figures of kings kings. And it wasn't only the inside that had these religious connotations, because when he went outside, the entrance facade, which you see here, was treated like a cathedral or an abbey. So, like a cathedral or the abbey, it had two great towers here, and low down here, there was a screen of niches. And the niches, 27 of them, contained statues of English kings and queens. So, King Richard II's Westminster Hall, absolutely uniquely in English architecture, sought equivalent status with the most important religious buildings. This, of course, was a comment on his particular take on kingship. <laughs> 